Greg Masters from the New South Wales Committee of the Evaluation Society. I've got a couple of my colleagues from the New South Wales Committee here. I saw Karen here. I think Flo might have been um, here, our first wild chair. Um, Jade is, is here as well. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the uh, land where I'm coming from today, Barkenjung, up in the central coast of New South Wales. Perhaps people might want to pop in um, the chat where what lands are there coming from today, or whether they're, I know we have some overseas people um, with us today as well. And I guess I'd just also like to acknowledge the pretty difficult times um, First Nations people are experiencing at the moment around the uh, referendum, whether as passionate advocates for the, for the voice or um, non-committal or opponents. Um, I think they're being put under enormous pressure and worse still, some absolute crap that we've seen on social media and not just social media, general media in um, in recent times. So I think um, I think the acknowledgement of the difficulties around that is, is worth worth remembering. Um, today's session, I'll give you more details about that in a moment. Is is one of our, as many of you would know, we've got some frequent flyers here. Um, our monthly free events that we organise um, for um, by the New South Wales Evaluation Society. Although in the um, Post-COVID age, the concept of borders in New South Wales and Victoria are a little bit irrelevant. So we do get pe lots of people from different parts of the country and internationally, as I mentioned. So welcome to everybody, and particularly some, I know we've got some new uh, New South Wales members joining us today, and some people who haven't been to these um, before, and really encourage people who aren't members to think about um, joining up. We've got some interesting events over the next uh, few months, evaluation and criminal justice. Um, Systemic reform uh, methodologies and metrics, uh, looking at the um, hardy perennial of randomized controlled trials, which has gained a bit of um, interest with the establishment of the evaluated general announced in the Commonwealth budget um, last week. Interesting article in the Mandarin for those of you who read that um, publication about RCTs and their, and their shortcomings, which many of us would know. Um, and we've also got uh, the conference in Brisbane and early bird discounts are available um, now, I gather. Um, so you might, it'd be great to get together again um, face to face. Um, those of you who've just joined, we do have a poll going around where people work just out of, out of interest. Um, so fill that in if you get a chance. Um, today's session um, about evaluating um, advocacy, which is another hardy uh, perennial, I guess. And we've got two all fabulous speakers and two um, fabulous, um, or from two fabulous organisations to talk of, talk about that. So uh, Rivka Nissen, Nissen will be leading the presentation, really. Um, she's the impact manager at PIAC, the Public Interest Advocacy Centre. Advocacy Centre, and I'll, I'll get uh, Nisca to, Rivka to provide us some more details about uh, PIAC um, shortly. And then followed by Rivka will be um, Camilla Pandolfini, who is the um, CEO at the Redfern Legal Centre. I should declare an interest. I'm on the on the board of Redfern Legal Centre, so um, but nevertheless, it is an amazing organisation, and like PIAC has really done some uh, made some great gains for um, social justice in New South Wales and nationally. Um, a really good roll up today. Um, so thanks a lot for coming, and I'd also like to acknowledge. Uh, our friends from uh, Simna, Paula, who I think put this out through um, their network as well, and uh, as did um, uh, Ruth and Camilla. And considering I thought I had a box. So we're going to hear from um, Rivka. Just a, a bit of action. I think I've been able to mute that one. Um, so the format is, well, I'm going to be handing over to Rivka uh, shortly, then um, pass over, she'll pass over to Camilla, and we'll probably then just open it up for Q&A um, during the session. Uh, might want to start popping in some questions in the chat that we can uh, toss around. Our ex recent experience of putting people in small groups hasn't been great. We get a big dropout yeah. often, and we're getting a preference that people do like larger sessions, even though this is a very large group. So we will have to do it by probably having questions by chat, um, but we can do that after about half an hour or so. Over to you, Rivka. Thanks, Greg, and hi, everyone. I'm coming to you from Gadigal land in not so sunny Sydney. Um, I also acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, and I note that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, 
Thank you for inviting me to speak today. This is going to be interesting, I hope, I think. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background to PIAC and the work that we do and the genesis, I suppose, of our impact framework and our impact work generally. And then I'll talk a little bit about the framework. I'll talk to a little bit of the framework and then I'll throw to Camilla and then as Greg said, we'll have a bit of a chat. So PIAC, for those who aren't familiar, as Greg said, we're the Public Interest Advocacy Centre. We're a not-for-profit social justice law and policy centre based here in Sydney. We've been around for 40 years. We had our 40th birthday last year. And what we do is best defined, I suppose, as legal policy and advocacy work that is often done in partnership and in collaboration with others to challenge laws, policies and practices that cause or contribute to injustice. So social justice law and policy work broadly defined. At the moment, we're working across five policy areas, civil rights, climate and energy, disability rights, First Nations justice and homelessness. So I joined PIAC at the start of 2022, so just short of 18 months ago. Um, my background, well, I've done a whole bunch of weird and wonderful things. Um, for most of my life, I suppose I've worked in and around the social justice, social policy, human rights sort of space. A lot of the time with not-for-profits, some time in government, statutory agencies, most recently in the private sector. Um, before I joined PIAC, I was in the private sector as a consultant, which is where I did most of my evaluation and impact work. But for most of my life, I've been, I suppose, a policy geek with a sideline in project management. So I call that out um, really because I guess it shapes my approach to the way I engage with this whole world of impact and particularly the way I approach the impact work at PIAC. Um, I guess I came to impact measurement, impact management evaluation as a practitioner in, as I said, policy and project management, and then learnt these skills and then have applied them for the last few years. So I guess that's really framed the way that I come to work that I do. Um, so when I joined PIAC, I had a number of conversations with our CEO, Jonathan Hunya, about where PIAC was at on its impact journey, which I have to put in quotation marks, but it genuinely is an impact journey that I think organisations go on and people go on as well. So a few things stood out for me from those conversations that go to, I guess, the genesis of the impact framework and our impact approach at PIAC. The first thing was that engaging me as PIAC's first impact manager is not PIAC's first go on the impact roundabout. They'd made a commitment a number of years ago to build a culture of impact within the organisation and a very genuine commitment from both the perspective of wanting to be better at um, articulating impact, measuring impact, talking about impact, but also genuinely as a social justice organisation, achieving impact. If you think about what impact means in a social justice context, it is actually change. And as PIAC, that's very important. So they'd made a commitment some years ago to building a culture of impact. What that looked like was they'd done a fair bit of work, particularly on theories of change. They'd developed theories of change for a number of key projects and done some work on a theory of change for the whole organisation. So I promised Jonathan I wouldn't reinvent the wheel. Um, that I would build on what was done already that was already very solid and um, take it from there because that was a very solid base from which to start. The second thing is that Jonathan talked to me about um, impact management being important to PIAC as well as impact measurement, which I thought was very smart. And I would think that's smart as a project manager, but um, I thought it's very smart because as I don't need to tell you guys, impact is not just an end of the process thing. It's as much about how you frame and you establish the work that you do. So you set up your outcomes, you set up your objectives, you set up your activities with ideally a line of sight towards those things and then look at how you're going to measure them. It is an end-to-end -end thing, not just a thing that you do at the end. So I thought framing it in a establishing impact, planning for impact, managing for impact, and then measuring impact, establishing it within that frame, um, I thought was a very smart way to do it. 
it also said to me that whatever I developed by way of impact measurement approach was going to have to be useful in project planning and management as well as impact measurement. The other thing that really stood out was that what PF really was wanting and needed was a holistic approach to how they did or we did and do impact. So a way of conceptualising and articulating impact both at the organisational level but also at the project and program level and an approach that would really bring these two things together. So bringing a real level of consistency, I suppose, to how we do this impact stuff across the organisation and building the capability across the organisation. So um, that was really what framed it for me. So speaking in consulting terms, I took that as my brief. And that was the background, I guess, um, from which I thought about the building an impact framework for PIAC and what has eventually become our global impact framework. So um, Greg asked me to talk about, well, he suggested I might talk about some challenges. Um, we can frame challenges as opportunities, depending on how we look at them. But I guess the two main things that I would call out as being the things that were front of mind for me when I started to work on PIAC's framework, the first is just the sheer diversity of the work that PIAC does. So I called out the number of themes or areas in which we work, and that's, um, that's wonderful, and it's also not unusual. A number of organisations work across a number of areas. But particularly in terms of the impact management and measurement, um, the things that really gave me pause for thought were the diversity of the types of work. So PIAC does everything from strategic litigation, so test cases, casework, legal advice, advocacy in a legal sense. Um, we do legal service delivery. We run a homeless person's legal service, which, as the name suggests, is a legal service for homeless people. Um, we do a lot of work on policy and advocacy, and we have a very strong focus on collaborations and partnerships, but in a very genuine sense. So working with partners and others in ways that amplify the voices of the people that we work with and really serve to, um, we do use the word empowerment, but in a very genuine sort of way um, to empower and amplify the voices of our partners, particularly in our work around First Nations justice and disability rights. So in terms of types of work, they're really quite different. So um, it is a strength of what PIAC does. But for me, I guess the challenge was how do I come up with an impact measurement and management approach that will speak to the diversity of these types of work and be able to be applied across these different types of work, but not be so broad as to be meaningless. So something that was actually going to be able to be tangible and applied in a very practical sense in all of these different areas. Um, along with that diversity of types of work um, comes a diversity of funders with a diversity of needs and interests in impact measurement. And um, that, as I won't go into detail, but um, that brings its own um, interestingness, I suppose, in terms of what funders think of as impact or what is important to them in terms of what they conceive of as impact, what they would like to see and how they articulate that. And we've had a number of very interesting conversations in the time that I've been here um, around what that looks like. The second challenge slash opportunity is the advocacy thing, broadly defined. Um, PIAC is quite upfront about doing advocacy and being about systemic change. It's not a thing that we shy away from. But oftentimes, these concepts can be quite slippery and not well understood by funders, but also by government, by people who aren't us, basically. People have different ideas around what advocacy means, what systemic change means. And there can be a suspicion, I suppose, about what's actually being done and what's actually being achieved when we say we're doing advocacy and we're about systemic change. So it was important to me to be specific about what we are doing when we are doing the business of advocacy and what systemic change looks like, how will we know it when we see it, or we see bits of it, and no doubt we will talk more about that in the conversation, and obviously how we'll measure it. So in developing the framework, I set out to develop something that does three things. The first is give us a line of sight across all of Piat's work and between the framework as a whole and frameworks for individual projects. 
The second thing I needed to do was to be fit for purpose. And I use that language a lot, probably to the point that it bores people to hear it. But um, I think fit for purpose is important. In this context, I mean that the framework has to do what it needs to do and nothing else. Um, and why that's important is that this is the thing that really has to speak to people who aren't evaluators. It has to be able to mean something to people who are lawyers, who are practitioners, who are policy people within the organisation so that we can work with it. Um, it needs to be able to speak to stakeholders outside the organisation, um, particularly our funders and partners, because we need to have a live conversation about the way in which we conceive of and measure impact and what they need and, and how we can do that jointly. So it needs to be audience appropriate. So it really needs to um, do what it says it's going to do, not be overly elaborate. And um, I feel like, at least I hope, that what we've come up with is something that does do that. Um, the third thing is, and this kind of goes to the fit for purpose thing, is that it was important for me that it does what it says on the box, which is it is a framework for impact measurement. And part of that for me was defining what do we mean by impact measurement? And I thought this was quite important because I think impact is another thing that gets talked about a lot. And I think people have very different ideas of what it means. And unless I think we are clear about what we mean, it can contribute to confusion, to different expectations about what we're doing and what we're measuring and what people can expect from us. And I talk about funders when I say that, but I, you know, it's as relevant to partners, the people we work with, and also people internally. Um, impact can be a term that can be quite scary for people as in, you know, what if I'm not delivering impact? What if this is not impactful? Well, let's talk about what that actually means and how we know. It's not supposed to be a bar that you can't jump over. It's genuinely supposed to be, are we doing what we set out to do? So in our impact framework, I included a definition on what impact means in our space. So in the not-for-profit space. Um, from the Centre for Social Impact. For those who aren't familiar with the Centre for Social Impact, a bit of a shout out. I think they're pretty fantastic. I'm biased. I did the Graduate Certificate in Social Impact there a number of years ago. But they really, for me, produce some of the most useful, practical, fit for purpose, plain English resources around what impact looks like in a not-for-profit in a social justice space. And I just find them incredibly useful. So I really like this definition of impact from the Centre for Social Impact, um, what impact looks like in a not-for-profit space. They define it as the longer-term outcomes that are achieved from the activities, outputs and outcomes of an intervention, program, organisation or sector. And for those of you familiar with theories of change, it sounds very much like what you might expect to see in a theory of change, which is also helpful because it gives us a definition that we can work with in that context. So... Um, I'm going to go on now to talk a little bit to the framework, which is where I throw to my trusty assistant, Greg, who is helpfully throwing up slides for me. Um, I'm not going to talk through the whole thing. It's not very long. When I say the whole thing, it sounds big. Um, it's not the version that is on our website. It's 10 pages. There's a link to it. I think that was sent out with the invite or you can look it up. Um, that version is a summary of a bigger internal version that's got a lot more moving parts to it, but it basically... Is a summary of what the framework looks like. So I'm only going to talk to two slides of it um, because that really gives you a sense of what it's about. The first is our theory of change. So I built this and the impact framework um, that comes from it around PX five strategies for change that are set out in our strategic plan. And when I thought about how to cut this, I thought, really, I can't think of a better way to cut this then buy these five strategies because they are strategies. They are strategies for change. So in the left-hand column, we've got our priority areas that I called out before. Our strategies for change are, as you can see, exposing injustice, challenging decision makers. Thanks, Greg, for the arrow. That's awesome. I feel like, I feel like I should have one of those pointers. Um, identifying solutions, engaging the public and decision makers, and empowering people. Next to each of those strategies, we've set out what they look like as action. So what are we doing when we're doing those things? And I won't read through all of them, but broadly for exposing injustice, it's about exposing. We're about strategic litigation, research and advocacy. 
challenging decision makers primarily about our legal work. Identifying solutions is very much what we do in collaboration and partnership with others. Engaging the public and decision makers is broadly um, covers our advocacy and much of our communication and public engagement work. Excuse me. And then empowering people is, as we say there, around resourcing and supporting advocates, people from target populations, and as I talked about before, working in ways that amplify the, um, the voices and the work of the people that we partner with. And then we've got some broad outcomes that sit against each of those things. And these will, um, we'll step these out a bit in a sec, but broadly, there's intended to be, I'm going to talk about line of sight, a line of sight here between strategy, the action and the outcome um, across that um, horizontal plane. And broadly, the impact we would like to see is a fairer, stronger society, which is a statement um, or an impact goal that really reflects PAC's strategic ob objective. Um, so I'll jump to the next slide. Thank you, Greg. So this really builds out the theory of change and it adds a couple of other columns that set out some short to medium term outcomes and some indicators. Um, this really is the global impact framework. So the way that this is intended to be used and it does get used is it's something that we use to frame how we measure and report on our impact across the organisation. We also use it as a template when we develop impact frameworks for individual programs and individual pieces of work. Um, the short to medium term outcomes in here are intended to, again, there's intended to be a line of sight between the actions and the long-term outcomes. These short to medium term outcomes are the things that we can measure. Um, I use the language of short to medium term loosely. Um, in some projects, it will be appropriate to set out short term and medium term outcomes. Um, in others, that's not so useful, but this basically gives us the what is the stepping stone, what are the measurable things and the things that we are working towards in the life of or through the life of the piece of work that contributes to these long-term outcomes and then to the longer-term impact. Um, the language in the outcomes and also the indicators, uh, it's really chosen with a view to be things that we can measure but also give us the ability to measure change over time. So things like visibility, influence, understanding, capability, these are all things that, as I said, are measurable, give us ways or there are ways that we can show change in these things over time, but they are things that apply to the different projects that we do, but also to us as an organisation as a whole, and we can measure change in these things over time at both of those levels. The indicators... Um, was a bunch of fun developing indicators. I live in, I don't know about anybody else. I love indicators. <laughs> she says, I have a love hate relationship with indicators. No, really. Um, I do love indicators, but they can be tricky to nail in my humble opinion. So these really are umbrella indicators. Um, they are deliberately framed broadly. Um, to give us the ability, as I say, to measure against our outcomes at the whole of organisation level, but to give us a way of, I suppose, having a common language for indicators, KPIs, measures of success, what have you at the project level, and which is how that we use them. Um, we do use them to inform, we've got a number of organisational KPIs, but um, we've also got measures of success, indicators, KPIs, what have you for individual projects that reflect the language in these umbrella indicators. So I have found them useful in framing those things so that there is, again, that line of sight between the way that we measure outcomes and impact at the project and program level, having that speak to this broader impact framework. We've now got impact frameworks for four projects and um, their outcomes and their indicators do align with these, which is also handy because it means that we can use the measurement that we do for those projects as part of our global reporting. And um, as I said before, not reinventing the wheel, wherever there's an opportunity not to do that. I, um, I like to not do that. The other thing that I'll mention 
on these indicators is um, the language that we've used here, or I've used here about extent. Um, using this language gives us the scope to use quantitative and or qualitative measures to measure change both at the global level and the individual project and program level. Um, this is quite important because, you know, I'm, well, I'm a mixed method practitioner, so I like both quant and qual, um, but also our funders, our partners have a preference for sometimes more of one than the other, but oftentimes both. But it's, I'm going to say fit for purpose again, it's about what's fit for purpose. And this gives us the opportunity to say, right, in terms of outcome X, it's really important to look at some quant measures over here to look at how we've contributed to those outcomes in a quantitative sense, whereas for something else, it's really more appropriate or more fit for purpose to develop some qualitative measures to really speak to a particular type of outcome. This gives us the ability to do both. And in particular, when we're looking at measuring the impact of advocacy, which I won't go into now because we're about to talk about it, um, that language of extent gives us the scope to um, measure things like influence and contribution, which when I'm talking about measuring the impact of advocacy, we're talking about, and you can see some of that in some of those indicators, some of that language, we're talking about um, the extent to which we influence change. Um, and so broadly, we're talking um, oftentimes about contribution when we're talking about measuring the impact of advocacy. And I won't go into that because I know it's going to come up shortly. Um, that really is all that I'm going to say, I think, at this point. So on that note, thank you, Greg, and I'll throw to Camilla. Thanks so much, Rivka. Uh, my name's Camilla Pandolfini. For those who joined a little bit late, I'm the CEO at Redfern Legal Centre. I'm also on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation and wanted to acknowledge it, uh, elders past and present and any First Nations people here with us today. Um, I've had the pleasure of working very closely with Rivka because for 10 years I was also a PIAC um and the final three of those i was part of the management team as principal solicitor so um i very much enjoyed working with Rika and learning about impact and i thought i'd just talk briefly about um redfern's work which is a little bit different but a little bit the same as piax but then um i guess i have some questions for for Rivka that i thought i could bring that come from the experience of Sort of um, doing the work and experiencing what it is to be in an organisation that has moved to measuring impact and thinking about a theory of change because PIAC looked very different when I first started to where it is now and I think that is a lot to do with thinking about impact and thinking about how we want to frame our, how we at PIAC want to, want to frame our work so Redfern Legal Centre, like PIAC, is a community legal centre based in New South Wales. We're different to PIAC in that we're a local CLC. So we have a whole lot of local services and also statewide services. Um, so we do work in our sort of local catchment and then statewide. Like all community legal centres, and this is very much my um, passion speech about community legal centres, what makes us unique is that we do casework, so we work with individuals, it, either in large scale systemic cases, but um, more for Redfern in everyday cases, in advice, representation, information. And then we use that work to also think about what's the change that we want to see? What's the systemic change that needs to happen to stop this disadvantage or this um, access to justice or inequality issue happening? So it, it's a I think it's a point of difference that community legal centres really bring. And it also, as Rivka has talked about, means that it's complicated to measure impact because we do a whole lot of different things and all of those things are crucial to create the change that we do. Um, as, as a local CLC and a statewide CLC, um, it is important that we service the communities that we work with. So a bit of our thinking about impact at Redfern is actually how many people did we see, how many 
information and referrals did we provide? Because that is showing to a certain extent the impact we've had on the communities that we work with just through the sheer numbers and um, demand far outstrips supply of legal services in the community legal sector and in people experiencing disadvantage. So that is important as well. Um, for Redfern Legal Centre, we wanted to think about what, what is the impact we want to see and how is it that we make change? And for us, we thought that was improved wellbeing, equal access to justice and a just and fair legal system. So some points of similarity there with PIAC as well. One of the ways that we measure improved wellbeing is that we survey our clients. That's um, very resource intensive and and we always have to think about whether it's important to, to send that survey to that individual, um, you know, depending on their circumstances. But we survey our clients the first time we talk to them three months in and at the end of our interaction, whether that just be information and advice or ongoing representation for a number of years. And then our impact report that um, Greg has brought up there, looks at the way that we have impact through improved wellbeing, so the responses to those surveys. It thinks about um, how we've managed to increase equal access to justice through the work that we've done with individuals and how we've contributed to a just and fair legal system through the systemic advocacy we have. So our impact um, report there that anyway there's a, it, it, Greg's posted the link it has a bit of narrative so there's narrative about client stories and what happened to one particular individual that we thought was particularly important to talk about and then it's also stories about a narrative about the change we've created in some systemic or policy space so working with government to say we're coming across this issue every day and it needs to change collaborating with the sector as a whole to say we're all seeing this issue and and we think there needs to be change here and demonstrating how that change has happened in a sort of narrative way um and then there's numbers as well so there's responses to our surveys and how many clients we've seen as well so i i guess impact can look different depending on what the, the work that you're doing. And I guess Rivka, one of the questions that I have is about um, thinking about that measurement and, and making it fit for purpose across an organisation that does so many different things like PIAC. And, and how do you, um, I suppose, give equal weight to the, the impact that you might have had on one individual as well as that huge systemic impact that you might have had thinking about the fact both of those things might have taken the same amount of time and resources? Ah, oh, that is such a good question. Um, I should say for those playing along at home, these are genuine questions. I don't have them. So yeah. <laughs> if, I've, if I've got a thinking face on, I'm genuinely thinking. Um, I th Look, it's interesting. I think, I think the idea of equal weight is interesting. I don't know that I think about it in that way. I think about it as... Um, I'm going to say fit for purpose again. I think if what the what a piece of work is primarily about is creating outcomes for individuals, then that's what's of greatest importance. If a piece of work is about systemic change, then that's what will have the greatest weight, I suppose. I think what what I think about in relation to that is I suppose oftentimes the impact we might think we're about or one might think is front of mind is not necessarily what is front of mind or what is actually what we're going to create or we might but there's other stuff that we might be missing in that focus on the one thing so I think why I find our framework helpful is I sit down with people oh, when I'm Lisa calling about Isla kid you just left a message on my phone um when I'm working with someone an impact framework for a project I'll sit down with with the framework and we'll look down the strategies and I'll go, so what are you doing? And I'll go, oh, this is a project about, you know, blah, it's about, it's primarily about litigation, so we're doing this. And I go, okay, that's fantastic. Let's talk about how we measure that. But it sounds to me like you might also be doing some stuff in the empowering space. It sounds like you're working quite closely with X or Y group 
and that might have some impact around amplifying their voices or building their skills or capability and they might go actually that's true too so I guess I think about it as um as how do we look to the different types of impact that we might create and make sure that the things that aren't necessarily front of mind um, or the primary impact get some weight as well if there's other stuff there too. That's great. Um, and, and so I can see, you know, the amazing work that people have done at Redfern before my time to think about um, creating a strategic plan and a theory of change and an impact report. And I certainly really experienced, as I said, the big shift in what was valued as an organisation at PIAG to a sort of greater sophistication, I think, in thinking about the change we we're making. Um, so I guess I was brought on the journey quite easily, but how, how, how do you think you, like what is the best way to bring say, funders or staff on the journey of thinking about how impact can improve the way you work um, or improve the way you think about the work you're doing? Yeah, look, that's a very good question because, you know, not everyone is a true believer, I suppose. And um, I don't know, but it's true. Like I, like I said, I wasn't born an evaluator or an impact person, you know. I was once a policy person that had to be not convinced very hard because I thought it was useful, but, you know, had bigger fish to fry and was like, oh, now we've got to stop and think about impact, you know. So it has got to be made, made useful to people. I think we talk about it in terms of how do you know if you're being effective? And that really is what it's about. Um, no matter what you're doing, you want to know that what you're doing is achieving what you're setting out to do. And if you're a funder, it's about is your funding achieving, are you achieving bang for buck, whatever that looks like for you? Is the money being spent in a way that is most consistent with your purpose and your objectives? Um, as a practitioner of any type, whether you're a lawyer or a policy person or, you know, providing services or what have you, you want to know that what you're doing is effective and achieving the outcomes that are relevant to the work you're doing so I put it in those terms and then it's a, a conversation around well what does that look like um, what do those outcomes look like to you and you know for me if it's a PAC conversation and you know this is not just blowing smoke like people genuinely no one's kind of turned around a PAC and gone why do we have to talk about this like everyone genuinely goes okay I can see why this is important but I think it's it's the job of people like me to go okay I can help you frame these things into outcomes and impact. You tell me what's important to you and I'll work with you to build that into something that we can measure. And then my final question is, say, for example, you're working in criminal justice space, as I have for a very long time, and, you know, it, it can feel very much like it's a long, very long and slow burn and you're throwing your absolute heart and soul into it and everyone around you agrees that this change needs to happen. Um, but I guess um, sometimes when, uh, so I think about it, I think, well, have I created impact or have I created change? So how do you keep the hope alive in, in that work where, you know, the impact that you want to have, say, is um, a big change that is going to take a big shift in, in thinking and community thinking and government thinking, and that hasn't happened despite doing your best work for a couple of years how do you how do you say to that person this is the impact that you've had and and that you are shifting the dial a little bit yeah um i've been there i was an advocate for a really long time and it's it can be a, it can be a slog like genuinely um it's about counting the wins and to count the wins we have to recognize the wins and I think um, it's been so interesting at PIAC, just somebody will tell me something or I hear something and I go, did you just say blah? And they'll go, yeah. And I go, well, that's fantastic. Like, that's a win. And they'll be like, oh, okay. You know, and people oftentimes will go, hey, I think we've got a win. And I'll go, no, that absolutely was a win. But oftentimes it's me sitting there going, that genuinely is a win. That actually is and you can count it. And it may not be massive in the scheme of things, but when I say... I don't want to say small wins because it makes them sound inconsequential, but it's the stepping stones or the breadcrumbs of the things along the way. You know, that time um, 
you heard from a ministerial advisor or someone, they, you know, you got a phone call or an email or you saw them and they said, hey, look, that briefing you gave us was so helpful. Um, if we hadn't spoken to you, we wouldn't have known X and we wouldn't have gone on to do Y. You know, that's fantastic. Or, um, you know, this government agency has agreed to trial this intervention that we've been lobbying for for years and it's only a trial and we don't know how much they're going to do or how long they're going to do it for, but they've committed to something where before that was nothing. And these are genuine wins, you know, and again, I'm not just going, hey, you know, be happy something happened. It's like, no, genuinely, these are markers of impact. These are outcomes, however um, targeted and specific, they are genuinely markers of impact. Hey, darling. <laughs> They're my questions. Perhaps I can throw to you, Greg, if there's questions in the comments. Great questions. Thank you, Camilla. Um, could people just indicate that they can hear me okay because I was getting some um, a couple of notes saying oh, I wasn't that clear. So that's good. Um, yes, we've got a couple of really interesting questions in the chat, which we'll come back to from uh, Maddie and Jennifer and others. Um, but before going there, I was actually, coincidentally, I got the email from PIAC yesterday from the CEO, Jonathan Punya, and he made the uh this the statement here the historian howard zinn observed that lasting change does not come as one cataclysmic moment propelling us to a new and better future instead we move zigzag toward a more decent society while history might record big leaps towards social justice such as achieving marriage equality or the high court at recognizing the native title these leaps only come after long and determined campaigns by many people who are recognizing justice and fight to change it and i think at picking on the piggybacking on the discussion we just had that uh, in, in relation to Camilla's last question, that really highlights two of the really big challenges in this area. One is we're bloody long haul. Um, and secondly, there's almost invariably multiple players involved in securing yeah. that sort of long-term systemic change and how you pinpoint PIAC or Redfin Legal Centres or whoever's contribution to that can be pretty challenging. And when do you, when do you as uh, Camilla asked, yeah, you know, abandoned ship or, or or choose to keep going because it, you understand that it is it is a long haul. Um, so interested in, in either Rivka or uh, Camilla responded to that, but then I think we should open it up if people could maybe indicate that they've got um, something to say on that topic. Put your put your hand up, uh, and then we'll come back to some of the questions that were lodged in the um, in the chat as well. Um, I'm happy to have a crack at that. So I'd say two things. Um, Contribution, yes. I said something in um, the piece we did with Philanthropy Australia about um, advocacy being a long game with many players. And so the contribution piece is about um, those specific wins or specific outcomes, but how do you um, isolate or define one organisation's role in the change? And um, it is a challenge, and I think the flip side of claiming your wins is not claiming wins you shouldn't be claiming. But I think overall, um, in my experience, just in life in this space, people tend to be more humble than um, take credit for things that they shouldn't. I think um, what I'm doing or what we're doing at the moment is doing some work with different techniques and contribution analysis to look at some... Um, some change stories and look at specifically doing some of the analysis and developing some stories that focus on a couple of scenarios or a couple of wins and going, well, what did PIAC contribute as opposed to any others? What difference did that make? How did we know? How do we get that evidence? So actually doing that and testing some of those techniques to see what that looks like um, for a couple of very specific things. Um, the other part to your question. Um, oh, which I really wanted to answer and now I forgot what it was. I was so busy thinking about the first part. Um, so long-term and also uh, the point that um, uh, I think was Jesse made as well around multiple partners involved in, in securing systemic change. Mm, yeah, and no, I think that was the, the second bit I've forgotten the first bit. Do you want to say something, Camilla, and I'll try and get my thought back? I don't know that I have that much to add. 
very happy to have some searing insights on this. You know, it's a, a, it's a very easy question to ask and a very difficult one to answer. How, how do you measure um, your, the impact of advocacy work when it could be literally decades or might be years before the work you're doing uh, brings about change? I know what it was, Greg, and it actually doesn't go to that question. You said something about how do you know when to stay and when to go. Um, yep. I'm a big believer in a timely exit. So it's not about just because something is long and hard. It's not about keeping on doing it, you know, at all costs. If something is not effective or you've done all the right things and the change isn't coming, I think it is appropriate and strategic to reassess and go, should we still be doing this or should we um, be in this space or doing something else or what have you? And I think, um, I think a clear-eyed sort of use of some of these impact measurement techniques can help to facilitate those conversations. So it's not kind of about, you know, impacts at any cost. I think it's that it comes back to that question of effectiveness. How does it? How do you know when you're there or when you're not? And um, you know, it's there's you know no shame in saying, okay, it's time to let this go. Yeah, and certainly we've had those conversations, haven't we, Rivka? When I was at PIAC about should we keep doing this work? Are we still having an impact? Are we the best ones to keep doing this work? And I think um, having an impact measurement framework and theory of change is a good way to, to stop and pause occasionally and think about whether you should keep going. Um, it, I feel like it really has helped to structure and inform those conversations as opposed to do we still have the energy for this or are we fighting a losing battle? Um, because sometimes it might feel like a losing battle and then all of a sudden something shifts and, and it might be something that you've won or it might be that you that you have an impact in some way and 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 you think that's as far as it's as it's going to go. Um, and as far as we can take this particular strategy. And mentioning theory of change there, I might uh, go to the question that was asked by um, Maddie in the chat and I'll hand over to Maddie. Let's hear a human voice rather than me repeating. And this is a challenging one. <laughs> Thanks so much, Greg. Um, so uh there's a lot of discussion around whether theory of change can actually you know adequately capture the complexity of of outcomes when particularly policy and advocacy is emergent and you and adaptability and taking up opportunities that present themselves in a really kind of ever-changing policy environment you know, how do you predict that and so I just wanted to say like your your theory of change looks amazing I'm really curious to know how long has it been around for and have you validated it over time to see whether the outcomes that you'd really like to see or you feel are, are being achieved, are they reflective of what was actually put into the theory of change? Question. Um, so it's been around, I suppose, in a iterative form for the last 12 months or so. We've put it out in the world a couple of weeks ago, um, but we've been working with it over the last 12 months to develop as I think I talked about um, specific outcomes and indicators for the organisation and also for different projects. Um, I think I, you, it's a good point about this work being emergent, and it is. Um, I would say two things to that. I would say, and, you know, this might sound sacrilegious to put something in a framework and then say hold it lightly, but... You know, there's at least one project, for example, that we're working with that the nature of the work, we're looking at how we can be most effective. We're rethinking what some of that looks like. Um, some of what sits in their impact framework, I think, invariably will change. And we're looking at that with the team and looking at what that means. Um, the may or may not have to be conversations with external partners or funders, depending on what that ends up looking like. but it's not a set and forget, you know, it's not you create something beautiful and then shape the work to fit and then the work has to go on that trajectory forevermore because you put it in a framework or theory of change. So I think it's being open to the fact that this is emergent work and if it is strategic to change things um, that you do. The other thing um, is I think... Um, 
God, I'm really bad at the second part of my questions today. This second time I've forgotten what I was going to say. Um, God damn it, I've done it again. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump jump in. Please, please do, Greg. Yeah. I'm clearly I, I, <laughs> obviously I mean, past my bedtime. <laughs> well, I think also with the theory of change, I think Maddie's point, I think you're right, Maddie, about the difficulty of in a com complex environment and the you know, cause effect links become tenuous or the interdependencies. But I think where a theory of change can be useful is in choosing whether you do get involved in work. It's almost as much a planning tool. So for example, our Redfern Legal Center, when it did its theory of change a few years ago, it wasn't thinking about taking on uh, COVID fines and the legal, you know, legal um, uh, the legality of those fines, but um, doing some casework around that and then some subsequent uh, advocacy that fed off the back of that was consistent with, you know, the raison d'etre, why, why Redfin Legal uh, Centre uh, exists. So um, I think it can provide a bit of a, um, a theory of change can provide a, well, should we even go there to think about this? Is this piece of work consistent with what we're trying to achieve in terms of um, addressing inequities or lack of access to justice or, 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 or whatever. Yeah, and similarly, I think it helps inform, um, you know, in, a, in an environment where we've all got like little resources and huge demand, it's really helped to inform Redfern's decisions around where we put our resources as well. And um, recently I was asking one team why they have this particular focus and they said, oh, you know, we tried doing this advocacy piece around this particular issue that tenants are seeing. Um, and tenancy is just, you know, you can imagine like just so in demand. Um, and they thought about how how are we like what impact are we having in the policy and advocacy space and what we needed was more casework and so they've had a real focus and resourced um, and work with partners to sort of um, expand their capacity to do particular casework to provide the evidence base to then go back and push on that that policy and advocacy piece to get the systemic change around that issue and I think there'll be space to then revisit the strategic plan and think okay, are we now having an impact in this way? We've thought, you know, we've we've put the resources into this um, and then maybe think about, have we made the change or do we need to, you know, pull some different levers, I guess, to, to have that impact and create that change that we want to see. And I think Denise Boyd made a really interesting point in um, the chat um, about being opportunistic and sometimes you just, it's better to pull out, you know, it might be that it's not going to be, amenable to a government um, at the moment, but might change. And, and she cited the example with our payday lending. Um, I might just go to a different sort of uh, uh, a more practical or, or direct level. So Ebony King uh, asked about qualitative measures and how that data, how those data are gathered when staff capacity is stretched. So um, Rivka, do you want to have a go at answering that? Yeah, I so much do because um, as much as I said, I love Paul and Quant equally, I do have a bit of a preference for Qual. Everyone loves a story. Um, I'm being facetious, but so much more than storytelling. But anyway, um, look, I think it's thinking creatively about what that looks like and um, also sparingly, I suppose. So we're looking at, for example, um, one project, we're looking at case studies, but very specific case studies that are collected within the way that we normally collect data. And I've gone, okay, tell me what you collect for this particular project. What do you input into the system? Could you add to that in a qualitative sense, not for every single case, but where something's got these elements to it, these are the things that we're interested in exploring because they're particularly outcomes you're looking for. Could you write a little bit about that? And they've gone, yeah, we could do that. Actually, they wouldn't take too much time and effort. So it's building it into what we've already got. Um, the other way is, as I said, I talked about some contribution analysis as techniques. Um, this is, I suppose, where it's helpful to have someone like me in a role like this who can put some effort into collecting some of those stories, potentially doing some external interviews, doing some of that triangulation and analysis. It doesn't need to be a burden on staff. 
Um, what I will say to the people I work with on that work is, okay, what I need from you is a couple of examples. They need to look like this. I don't want you to waste time writing stuff for me. Can we sit down and have a conversation? Then if I need anything more from you, I'll ask you. Otherwise, I'll go on away and find it myself and I'll come back to you and I'll check in with you. So it's, it is a, um, a luxury I acknowledge that not everyone, not every organisation has. But I guess what I would say to people who want to do more qual stuff is I think um, sometimes we think it's got to be all or nothing. Oh, we've got to survey everyone or we've got to write a case study about everything or we've got to, it doesn't have to be everything. Think about what are the particular things that that technique will be helpful to illustrate? What are the particular outcomes or where a particular story might be helpful? Um, can you collect five really good case studies or client stories or what have you? of you know a bigger sample size and you've got a bigger quantitative data pool and then some really um, tightly conceived really poignant qualitative case studies that will be really helpful to you and can i just encourage people feel free to put your um, um hand up um if you do want to jump in and add anything to the um discussion um as well there's been a couple of questions and I think it's been touched on a little bit um, around how staff and partners were engaged in the impact framework. Um, and you know, Camilla and Rivka, feel free to um, have a go at that one. Sorry, I just got caught up reading the chat. This is interesting. Um, so, we did a bit of workshopping with um, with some staff. I think not everybody in these global measures, but what we needed to do was, um, I guess what we were wanting to test when we did workshop them was that they made sense to people. They described the work that, um, that people did and um, they would be useful at that high level as kind of umbrella terms for the work. So, for example, positive legal and regulatory outcomes. Um, you know, Camilla, you said something about working in the criminal space. What does a positive outcome look like if your client ends up in jail? Um, well, it still might be a better outcome than what they otherwise might have gotten or, you know, what have you. So that language needed to be able to be fit for purpose for different types of work and resonate with different people. Um, and the indicators, I talked about that choice of language around influence, informing, understanding, it really is quite measured and they had to be things that people were comfortable with in saying, okay, you know, we're not talking about where we've achieved things or we're measuring where we've achieved things or measuring those sort of hard delivering things or what have you um, in that indicator space or the outcomes it's around are people comfortable with looking at ways in which we increase the profile of unfair laws and policies or influence systemic change or influence public debates, legal and policy decision making? Is that stuff that people are comfortable with in terms of things that describe their work? And then on a more sort of micro level, um, when I'm working with someone on a project level impact framework, I'll sit down and we will literally workshop it. So you know, as I talked about before, we'll talk about what strategies and actions are relevant to their particular project. For some projects, they'll be working across all of them. For some, um, they won't be working across all of them. There'll be one or two that are really prominent and maybe a third or a fourth that comes into play a little bit. And then we'll literally talk about what are the outcomes they want to achieve? What did success look like to them? And we'll frame versions of um, short or medium term outcomes that are things that they feel like they are working towards and that speak to them and then look at how they might measure them. And when there's a, um, a funder involved that's got their own measures of success or KPIs or indicators or what have you, we'll look at those and go, okay, um, how are we going to work towards those? How do we match the things that they're looking for to the outcomes that we're working towards? Where do they fit and what's that going to mean in terms of data collection and reporting? I think I think one of the things that someone else has mentioned and you have as well, Rivka, is that it, it it does take resources. Like it takes resources and it takes time. And so I guess if um, you don't get a Rivka, <laughs> then then someone at the organisation, be it the people that are doing the work or or part of the management team, like someone needs to champion it and feel 
passionate about it um and and i guess have the have the time and space a little bit to to do it so have it built into the time they allocate to their work um yeah because it, it does it does take time hey Rivka? oh yeah but <laughs> i would say look i talk to a lot of organizations that don't have someone like me that go um what can we do? And I'll refer them to resources like um, the Centre for Social Impact, those sorts of resources. And there's a couple of others that are really good and go look at the minimum, develop something, collect this data, report on it in this way. You know, there's ways of doing things that are, um, yes, it will take some time and effort and someone needs to be committed and drive it, um, but it doesn't have to be the whole box and dice and I guess it goes to the point before about theory of change I think um don't get bogged down in theories of change or impact frameworks or you know what have you build something that is I'm going to say for purpose do what you can but with the end in mind what do you want to do what are you doing this for do you need to um communicate your effectiveness to a funder or a potential funder do you want to measure what you're doing for the purposes of working out whether you continue or whether you stop or whether you change course you know so have that end in mind and then build something that does that within your resources can i ask a question it's been mentioned a few times about um funding and there are funders and funders and we know some government funders have uh explicitly or implicitly said keep away from advocacy work um, and um and other but uh, on the same at the same time are often moving more towards you know uh, demonstrating outcomes or impact and then there are non-government funders whether they're philanthropic organizations or others that are often um have different expectations um around impact um thoughts on thoughts on that and its implications for your work and measuring impact yeah, look, I think this is where I think that point about being really clear what we mean when we talk about impact and asking funders to be really clear what they mean. Um, and sometimes, and I'd say this with no disrespect, they don't know and they say they don't know, but they know that it's important or they say we know it's important, but we don't have a framework or a way of you're measuring it for us, but we expect you to do X, Y, and Z. And then some will go, okay, yes, we have a framework and this is what it looks like. So funders are on a journey as well, you know, very much so. And um, it also depends what they're used to funding. I think um, we're seeing funders that might have been used to funding certain things that are branching out, um, maybe not necessarily into the advocacy space as such, but into the social change or systems change or, those sorts of spaces where impact can be more nebulous but are used to seeing purely quantitative measures or you know very specific ways of measuring impact and are trying to get their heads around well this is what impact looks like you're doing this work you know it's that um it's that hammer to crack a nail type thing so it's going okay with respect i'm not sure that's fit for purpose um, we're doing this work, you're funding us to do this work, or you want to fund this sort of work. Um, here's some other ways you might want to think about looking at impact. And it is, um, I think it is, yeah, I'm going to overuse the word journey. It, it is a journey. And I think some just at the end of the day won't um, necessarily be convinced that qualitative measures can be as robust as quantitative measures necessarily or um, that advocacy is something that you can show impact in or what have you. But I think we have to have the conversation in our experience. Funders have been really open to having the conversation and um, it's, a, it's a good open conversation, I think, because it is kind of an emergent space for them as well. Um, but I think part of the advocacy stuff, apart from the fact that it can be politically unpalatable and sometimes very politically unpalatable, depending on the nature of government, is being specific about what we're doing. And so what, what does the doing of advocacy look like? What does it actually boil down to? Are we writing submissions? Are we meeting with influencers and decision makers? Are we doing media and communications activities? Are we, you know, what are the actual things we're doing? How are we going to measure whether they're having an influence? 
and being able to step it out for ourselves in that way so that we can say to funders, if you fund us for advocacy, this is actually what we're going to be doing with your money. Jeez, that's a cute baby. Um, <laughs> 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 and this is how we can show that um, what it's leading to or what contribution it's making. And I think, too, um, you, you can't underestimate the extent to which government, quite rightly, want to hear from the communities we work with and want to hear from us about the work we're doing and what our views are on law and what law reform should happen. Um, we get requests for submissions all the time. And that that is advocacy. You know, that is saying we do think, you know, maybe the law could be better. Thanks for asking us for our opinion. Um, and and community legal centres are inundated with requests to do that. So um, sometimes, you know, we build on that or responding to that as um, sort of bigger and broader work, but, but government interacting with, um, you know, the social change sector and the social justice sector and the community legal centre is, um, is something that happens every day in asking us for our opinions. Um, I might bring in Denise Boyd here unannounced. Sorry, Denise, just bring this on you, but you've made a couple of interesting um, comments and observations in the um, chat there. So would you like to either make a comment or ask a question there? And... No, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> oh, well. Um, no, it's just, um... I do think it, it can be really challenging because I've done, you know, work in big international NGOs and smaller government funded NGOs. And it can be very challenging like if you're if you're an organization that's relying on um, membership funding and, um, for, you know, big funders like Meyer, for example, um, you'll you'll think about how you attribute and measure your work differently. Um, then moving into the government sector, the government funded sector, where it tends to be, you know, like quite bold measures of number of people that have used your service. But that doesn't tell you anything at all about the impact that you're having. That's simply, uh, did you meet your service targets? So I, mean, I think Ruth is right because she talks about, you know, the value of the story. Um, and we often find that the best way to can you know I've often found the best way to convince somebody of the the benefits of funding a particular piece of work is that yes we can measure some of it but you also need to hear the stories of the people that have benefited from it and that will often have a lot more lasting impact they'll remember that much more than they'll remember a spreadsheet of numbers yeah does that I don't know if that's useful or not but that <laughs> on the hop that's what that's my that's my contribution Look, and and some really my experience is... in this area too, sorry, River, is that, um, go on, River, you, please, no, please go. I was, gonna, I was gonna say, look, I think it really is true. I was being flippant when I say everyone loves a story, but they do. And even people who go, you know, show us the numbers, they will look at a sheet of numbers and go, you got new stories. And that will be the thing that changes hearts and minds. But it's, you know, I guess it's as we talked about, it's how you tell the story. It's telling stories that illustrate outcomes and showing them, I suppose, giving stories their due as um, as ways of measuring and reporting on impact. It's not just a nice story that's going to make you feel good. It's actually a legitimate, robust way of reporting on outcomes and impact. So, Jonas, I'm going to pick on you now unannounced. I know you've uh, put a couple of uh, comments and questions in the in the chat risk of doing this is Jonas may have left his desk for a moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I thank you so much. Um, I have been thinking about how to evaluate advocacy works and then how uh, my understanding, my old understanding is that impact is something that um, brings change about in a wider society, not in an individual personal life. That was my my old thinking, and now I am about to be converted, but <laughs> to individual chance. But my question, I mean, this question has emanated from my experience that we have developed um, an outcome measurement framework and um, identified indicators, and uh, we developed survey um, instrument to interview 
how much has our advocacy work um, uh, made change in the community or the people, the target group we serve in. And we have, we have done all other surveys, but we have not been successful in reaching out to the policy makers. So I'm, I'm trying to find a solution to my own organizational problem. <laughs> so that's why I'm asking, have you ever tried to reach out to get feedback in either in the in, in, in terms of focus group discussion or survey or whatever? Or has it been, how easy has it been? Has it been difficult? Would you please share that experience to me uh, or anyone who needs to, those um, experiences? Thank you so much. Yeah, look, it's not something I've done as yet at PIAC, but I'm thinking about it. It is something I've done in work previously, in evaluation work previously, and it can be very powerful. I guess what I would say without you know, knowing specifically who you're talking to or what you're talking about is um, think about the range of tools at your disposal. So a survey is one means of doing that. Um, focus groups are another. Interviews are another. Um, an interview can be a conversation that is structured and you take some notes. Um, sometimes those conversations are better had by somebody who's not you. Somebody might feel... Um, more comfortable being honest if they're not talking directly to the organisation. Um, but we think about, I mean, you know, people talk about different things. I've done them in the past and called them key informant interviews. And you think about people who know you, know your work, and, and would at least be open to having a conversation, if not with you, then with someone about your work for the purposes of um contributing to an evaluation or impact measurement for what you're working on jointly or just helping you to think about when you're being as effective as you can be. Thank you so much. I mean, sometimes the very people that you want to get those views from are the ones who are pissed off by your involvement. If you're trying to um, change law or change policy, um, <laughs> uh, um, they're they may well be reluctant to admit that the organisation had any contribution to that because they, uh, it's, uh, they've been a thorn in the side. Mm. Although, Greg, I'm going to jump in because I think Camilla said something um, that I really agree with is that we, and I can't speak to your organisation, Jonas, but um, we often get, you know, PIAC always also gets requests for things from various levels of government. Um, you know, government is a broad church and oftentimes when you're doing policy work, you're doing advocacy work, you are working in parallel with people who are inside government who are trying to achieve similar things. And I say this having worked as a policy person in other NGOs doing this sort of work, um, you can develop quite mature and thoughtful and respectful and reciprocal and trusting relationships with your your um your colleagues on the other side of the fence and um, sometimes they will be in your shoes and sometimes you'll be in theirs in terms of the work you do you know people move back and forward out of government all the time so um, I think it's finding the people who are prepared to talk to you and it's not necessarily going okay go and interview the minister or you know whatever but it's picking out who the people are who understand what you're about and who do come to you and you do have a relationship with and um, and who are the right people with whom to have that conversation if there are if they are um, around and if they're not um, then you know that's a shame and sometimes it is just purely adversarial I'm not trying to you know be all sunshine and lollipops about it but um, oftentimes it is more of a, a I wouldn't say collaboration but a mutually respectful um, journey I suppose that it might sometimes appear. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that means we need an um, some someone who uh, can play an ambassadorial role between the ones who. Hey, could... yeah, darling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And indeed, that's uh, that discussion has prompted me to remember some work I did that predated Rivka and Camilla at PIAC many many years ago. So it's long enough to say that I I was involved in a, a review which was very much along those lines of. Um, pulling together information from disparate sources, but including a lot of key informant interviews with funders, partner organisations. And it was really insightful in getting a sense of 
uh, what difference that organization made sort of collectively, but also, you know, suggested tweaks or, or, or differences in the way it engages with the, the sector and, and more broadly. Conscious of the time, we've, we, um, as, as often happens, we've got a few people dropping off, but happy to hang, hang in here at all. Uh, we will definitely finish at, at 5.30. Um, just open it up. We've got fewer people around now, so feel free to just uh, throw a, a question in, um, either in the chat or, or probably vocally, if um, anyone's got a question of Camilla or Rivka or the larger group. Or maybe I'm going to go for another uninvited one. Jennifer Brown, I don't know whether you're still there, Jennifer, but you had a couple of interesting questions earlier on, I think, in the chat. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, hi. Um, sorry, I'm not very well, so I didn't put my camera on. Um, oh, sorry to pick but, on you then. No, 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 that's fine, that's okay. Um, I currently work for uh, Legal Aid New South Wales and I look after all the allied staff. And um, I guess I'm uh, one of the things I put in was a question around the um, consultation that you need to do to kind of feel like you've really evaluated the impact. Um, and I can't remember the other question I put up there, something about <laughs> um, something about, oh yeah, th those, the outcomes that you've found in terms of um, the communities you service, like, um, uh, uh, yeah, has that, has that met for, you know, significant change for your organisations at any time? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, Rivka and I talked about this in a particular project, um, but I left before that happened. So I don't know whether it happened that consulting with stakeholders. Redfern um, does surveys, um, and that was put in place before my time. Um, so it'll be great to see what comes back around the end of this financial year. Um, but yeah, Redfern, Redfern does surveys of stakeholders and then surveys of clients as well and and it's not just did we win your case for you it's like um did we provide a, a culturally safe and appropriate service um did you have additional needs in in talking with us and and did we meet them and did we improve your well-being and like your knowledge of the law um as well as just did, did, did we get you a successful outcome you know so really um evaluating that whole person service um but yes yeah, certainly I, I guess depending on the number of stakeholders and who you're working with and their capacity to put the time into that um you know I guess you could go deeper than surveys and have sort of conversations and think about the what the questions would be around those conversations and how you run them which is what Rivka and I had discussed in another project that had like a minimal amount of stakeholders. Um, yeah, but certainly Redfern does do that. But always good to think about, I guess, the better ways you could be doing that and evaluating that impact and the impact of your collaboration. Certainly like that, um, we've been mentioning before, you know, the it's sometimes not the little wins, but the little moments along the way. and. Um, certain stakeholders that were really important to us at PIAC, having conversations um, uh, with people and people just coming back with positive comments. Um, and, and that certainly happened at Redfern as well, where you feel like, oh, they're, they're really important to us and, um, and they're significant, a significant stakeholder and important for us to continue to know that we have their support to do that work and they've said something off the cuff positive um, that we'd record that, you know, um, to keep mm. as an organisation as a, a, a measurement and not something perhaps that would go out publicly, but um, that you as an organisation know you're doing, you're on the right track. Mm. Yeah, and one of the yeah. things that um, I'm working on currently is doing exactly that, trying to collate some of those internal stories so that um, hopefully when we get some time or funding or something, <laughs> um, that we can do a bit more in-depth kind of understanding around the impact of having allied staff and legal staff working together, you know, like integrated practice, particularly that's the kind of focus oh, yeah. I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah. That's super interesting and super new work, you know, as a sector mm -hmm. that we're all wanting to do that multidisciplinary working with other staff as well. Um, yeah. I was going to say as well, just 
um, because PIAC and Redfern are both not Aboriginal controlled organisations, but we both do both work with, um, mm -hmm. a, you know, a lot of Aboriginal controlled organisations and on issues relating to First Nations justice, that um, that feedback that we're, that we're listening, that we're doing the right thing, um, that we are supporting and capacity building First Nations organisations is really important as well to, um, to know that you're doing the right right thing in that work and in that space where you know first nations organizations should should be leading and to know that they're saying you, you know you 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 are building our capacity to lead this work yeah totally mm -hmm. um the other thing i would say so we also i think like Redfern oh. get those unsolicited yeah, yeah, yeah. emails um i saw one from that came into the legal service about a client we'd represented and how much you know we always go oh you know people always go oh this changed my life but this guy was like this changed my life this is what happened da, 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 da. you know so we do get those things come in um unsolicited and it's fantastic when we're looking at going out whether it be through case studies or interviews or what have you um what I'm really interested in is picking apart where someone's had an experience what was it about what we did that made a difference to them so, for example, we've got a women's homelessness legal service or women's homelessness pilot as part of our homeless persons legal service. And as part of that, we say we're going to work in a trauma-informed way. So the way that we deliver the service is has a level of importance alongside what outcome they got, whether they came for help with um, a housing issue or a legal issue or a debt issue or what have you. So it's looking at did we work in a way that was supportive, understanding, you know, all the ways that you would put trauma informed in plain English language to find out if people had that experience as well as what the actual um, outcome was for them. So it's the outcome from the process as well as the outcome of the outcome, I suppose. Mm. Okay, well, we're fast approaching 5.30. Um, Flo has just popped a um, survey in the chat. Really appreciate if you could just spend a minute or so to fill that out, it only takes that long. Um, included in that are any suggestions for future topics. I'm going to hang around um, online for a little while longer, and I'm really keen to hear ideas from people here as to topics they might have for our monthly events. Um, and in particular, if anybody's interested in uh, leading a uh, discussion on one of those, we'll be working with, with, with me or others on the, on the committee to do that. So really happy to, for people to put their hand up and say, I've got something really uh, interesting to share with um, a larger audience. Um, can I ask everyone to thank Camilla and uh, Rivka for giving us uh, giving up their valuable time um, at pretty short notice, I might say, um, to lead a really interesting discussion about um, super important um, topic around super important um, work. So thanks very much to Camilla and Rivka, and thank you everybody for turning up. But I did. Pay